The Monerotopia Price Report segment is sponsored by Local Monero. Avoid using KYC exchanges. Buy and sell Monero directly for fiat, peer-to-peer. All right, buddy, there. I think he's uh, is it frozen. Yes, Wait, I buddy. am. Sorry about hey. that. I was muted. How's it going? Good. How are you guys doing? Good, good, good. We we got a comment here. Tux is very handsome. It's it's true. Young and handsome. <laughs> um, but big week, huh? Oh yeah. Fi- finally, the the things the, the doldrums are over. <laughs> yeah, hope everyone's surviving out there. Um, it happening. hasn't been like too terrible. We're only back down to twenty five k for Bitcoin, but um, yeah, I mean. Well, like we talked about the past few weeks, it's like, where was the follow through? It, it should have happened. And at some point it just didn't happen. And uh, I posted on Twitter, I think it was like Wednesday. I don't remember exactly, but like right before things or as things were breaking down, it was like, eh, you got to hold like right now, right here, or there's a lot more downside. And so I actually just bounced out at that moment. I was like, nope, I'm, I'm taking profit. I'm, I'm not going to be in these markets. Um, still got the Monero, always got the Monero. Um, I picked up a I guess you could call them shit coins, but I picked up some altcoins um, back months ago that I said, ah, I'll probably just let these ride no matter what, um, just because they have like fundamental use stuff like um, Link, for example. Link is used across DeFi, and I don't care if it's like centralized. I know it's not like pure crypto. It's not money. It's not digital cash. It's not digital freedom money, but it's used a lot. So um, I, I hold a, a few coins here and there just as kind of off bet plays that I don't have to look at. But um so yeah, I mean, a lot of stuff. But you, you, stuff pulled, you, you pulled out some some of your Bitcoin or whatever before. Yeah, yeah, I basically pulled my long term trades off the table uh, wow. into stable coins, which at this moment, eh, I'm I'm not exactly super comfortable with being in stable coins either. But um, what really? I probably go you're ahead. worried about you're worried about the stables even. Yeah, um, we'll talk a, we'll talk a little bit about that later on, um, but. What I'll probably end up doing here is is try and wait for gold to um, I guess let's pull up the gold chart. Uh, so this is gold right here, and <clears throat> if the stock market and and every so we've talked about for months here where um, you know we we expected that big long move to the upside, and then we were kind of trying to to sort of see if we could time the top, you know, and then and then get out, and then I've been predicting that towards the end of this year we were going to see a reversal uh, and things needed to go back down to the lows. I think that the odds are very likely that that's what we just saw here is the beginning of that move back down. doesn't have to be lower lows, doesn't have to be the exact a double bottom, but somewhere close to that area. Um, I think the odds are that we've started this move. So gold right here, this is the weekly chart. Um, gold is now correlated. Everything's correlated because what do they do? They just print money. So when you print money, everything goes up. And when you, um, when you get hawkish and you contract, you tighten the monetary policy, um, everything goes down together. So... Um, we're kind of seeing that with gold. I mean, yes, you know, you'll see divergence uh, for a period of time with asset classes, but basically everything's is sort of correlated. So I would expect gold at this point, if my thesis is correct, that the broad markets are going to are going to be moving back down somewhere close to their lows. This right here is is kind of your target area um, to pick up some gold if you were like at least that's what the chart would say, right? Fundamentally, you might say, well, there's all the inflation, you know, and gold, and I don't care. I'm just going to keep stacking, DCAing. Uh, whether that's Bitcoin, Monero, really, um, or gold. So um, we've got the cluster of moving averages here, This uh, these big blue bands that you can see. Um, these are very long-term standard deviations. They're actually upper standard deviations. They're under price because price, uh, gold prices moved up so high so quickly um, from this like the 2018, 2019, uh, and 2020 movement. Um, you'll see they kind of like held a sort of the support. And again, I really do think it's likely to come back down, get into this zone somewhere here. Uh, and then that's like kind of the target place to pick up gold. So in terms of stable coins, what I'll probably do is is um, leave at least half of my stable coins once gold gets down anywhere reasonable. Um, if I see anything in crypto that that seems like systemic risk in progress, I'll probably bounce out sooner than later. But if um, guys like Binance and Tether keep holding on, uh, I'll probably just stay in the stable coins as long as I can. Um, but, uh, you know, I'll probably get into like PAX G or something like that. Um, just as a way of kind of like mitigating the risk of, um, you know, the, the stable coin risk is, I mean, that's a central third party that I'm depending, <clears throat> that I'm depending on, but you know, it's, it's kind of hard. It's kind of hard to hold any type of us dollar pegged instrument that you're not going to have some sort of uh, central party that you're dependent on. 
Um, what do you what do you see as being the most stable stable coin, the most reliable stable coin? At this point, um, I mean it's it's really hard to say. Like it's it's hard to. I mean I'm guessing here. I would still say USDC. Um, so I guess I'll, we can kind of go out of order. Um, there man, there's so much to talk about. I hope uh, I hope we have time to get to it all. Um, because there's a lot of big news events that are happening that are starting starting to like boil in the crypto industry as well. Uh, so USDT is in green and USDC is in white. Now, we've seen the market cap of USDC take a really big hit since um, starting right around March. Um, you saw people kind of exiting USDC and it's sort of just been down, down, down. It looks like it might be starting to round out. But what you'll notice at the same time is that USDC, uh, sorry, USDT, Tether market cap has kind of like absorbed all that. So there's this theory, um, CZ and Binance are on the ropes and that's not even a theory like they are in trouble. Um, the Department of Justice has been thinking for a long time about prosecuting him criminally. Um, obviously, he's got, you know, CZ's got the lawsuit. Um, we've got, um, there was even this story, uh, so sorry to kind of bounce around here a lot. Like it's all, it all relates to you. We got a lot. Yeah. No, you could just, just flow, man. Get it all out there. So I don't know if this is true or not. Um, but this is like floating around crypto Twitter that basically, um, Binance chain BNB coin has not dropped below 212 because CZ is basically selling Bitcoin to prop that price up because he's got a liquidation, uh, price down there. So supposedly he posted up some collateral. Um, to to not liquidate like the BNB, I don't know his holdings in BNB, something like that. Um, is this true? I don't know. Uh, this has been floating around a lot, um, but it wouldn't surprise me in the slightest. Uh, and that could actually be a big motivating factor here, but uh, for why crypto has sold off. Um, you know, uh, CZ is selling a bunch of Bitcoin, um, and he's trying to like keep his exchange from collapsing. Um, so I do think that. There's a, a high probability, or maybe maybe not high, not like extremely high, but I think the odds are greater than 50% that CZ is basically in a struggle to survive, uh, for his exchange to survive. I mean, we know that he doesn't have the Monero that he says he has. Um, it's likely that he's fractionally reserving other coins. I think they did that with Doge for a period of time. And I think um, I think the Bcash or the Bitcoin Cash people have convinced me that they, they might be doing that as well with Bitcoin Cash. Um, so... Anyways, uh, but even so, the th so sorry. So we'll cut coming back to to the stable coins. The theory is that USDC is being sold off um, and is being redeemed because you can't actually redeem Tether um, because they don't actually have all of the backing, or and or they don't have the ability. The backing they do have, they might not be liquid to be able to send you actual US dollars through the banking system because they're kind of in trouble as well in a lot of ways. Although I do suspect, I do wonder if they are connected. Um, it kind of like under the table to, um, I don't know, sort of like big corporate deep state entities. And they just like, they, they continue to, um, <clears throat> sort of operate with impunity, if you will. But anyways, the, the theory is that USDT is not really redeemable. They, they barely redeem anybody, but that USDC is redeemable because they're run by Black, uh, BlackRock and they've actually got treasuries backing those. Um, now they've never had an audit. All they have are attestations. So I'm just guessing here. But the theory again is that people are swapping their USDT, their tether into USDC, and then they're actually selling that USDC into real dollars to, mm. I don't know, to collateralize, whatever. Again, this is speculation. These are theories. We don't have much more than kind of like, mm, that kind of makes sense, bro. <laughs> so, you know, put on your tinfoil, whatever. Um, but that, that is a theory that's out there. Uh, so, but so you think t tether might be in trouble is, is what you're saying? Yeah, it's, it's very possible Tether Tether could be in trouble. I mean, I feel like this is something we've heard from day one about Tether, and it just never, you know, obviously it could happen at any time. But I feel like everybody's been saying that forever about Tether. I always yeah. kind of always thought about the idea is, you know, there was this campaign against stables as a way to keep people in Bitcoin, right? Because there was nowhere else to go. Uh, I don't know. What, what do you think of that? Because it, it's it's been. For a long time, right? I mean, in, in in previous bull markets with Bitcoin, it was always warned against, like, no, don't go into don't go into tether, don't go into stable coins. They might collapse. And I feel like that kind of kept a lot of people in Bitcoin because they felt like they had nowhere to go. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't want to fall into normalcy bias, um, and it does seem like tether has been very resilient. We know that tether has been operating fraudulently. Like, there is no question about that at this point. Anyone that has come to the table and done the research from an unbiased standpoint, just to understand like 
what is the lay of the land? How, like, what's the evidence we have? It's very clear that Tether did not have all of their backing for quite a long period of time, um, that they were slushing funds around. All of the stuff that the independent investigators figured out um, over the years, like pretty much um, from, say, 2017 through 2020, sort of that time period that was being analyzed by the independent investigators. When the New York Attorney General um, prosecuted their lawsuit or um, their case against Tether, they actually didn't go to court. They settled outside of court, but they did force Tether to turn over a bunch of documents. They uh, they validated all of the things that the independent investigators said. Like they they said, hey, we've we've gotten all the millions of pages of documents from Tether. Here's what's been going on. They didn't have the backing. They said they did. Um, so it's it's very clear that Tether has been operating fraudulently. Um, but <clears throat> they they didn't get like they only got a slap on the wrist for that. They got eighteen point one million dollar fine. Hilariously, the next day after they settled for that amount <laughs> with the New York Attorney General, they minted literally 18.1 million tether, um, which I think was just them kind of trolling. If you've ever followed Paolo, he's, he's kind of uh, kind of like a troll the way he responds to people. So, but you know that doesn't mean that it has to collapse. And this is kind of the thing where it's like, oh well, you know, tether hasn't collapsed. How can it be a fraud? Like, well, I mean, there's so many frauds that went on. Like Bernie Madoff went on for two decades and didn't collapse. Right. So, um, you know, I don't want to fall into a normalcy bias pattern. Um, I do think that Tether would be like the last thing that that any of the crypto insiders or the crypto cabal or the suits in crypto, they probably don't want Tether to collapse more than anything because that's mm. still like still the primary um, liquidity, like the liquidity pair between exchanges for, for altcoins and all kinds of stuff. Um, so, I mean, really, I've kind of I'm spread between a little bit of Tether, a little bit of USDC, a little bit of DAI. Um, and the, the die is nice because they can't actually freeze your specific die. They can freeze the USDC that goes into backing die. Um, and it's not only backed by USDC, but it's like, I think like 60% or some large component. Um, but there's also sort of the algorithmic component as well, where maker and die sort of act together. Um, so what, what um, exchanges like, do you use body? I don't know if I ever asked you that. I play on Ethereum, man. I, uh, oh. I will occasionally use Trocador, especially for Monero stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, sometimes I'll use flick, uh, fixed float, but you can't access fixed float from Tor anymore. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I kind of, but yeah, I mean, I, I try to do the, like the decentralized stuff, right? So I'm on Ethereum. Uh if they can ever prove, and I still want to see probably another year or two of these sort of layer two rollups um, functioning. Mm -hmm. And I would like to see them have their keys destroyed because um, they're still like, as they say, as Vitalik says, says, they've got training wheels on right now. So they're kind of in a beta phase where like they're running the code, but the the run like the people running these projects or behind these projects still have admin keys. They could still freeze your funds. They could still do like tricky stuff. So it's not entirely trustless. I would love to see them get rid of those training wheels at some point here. Maybe it'll take a year. Maybe it'll take three years. I don't know. But I use Ethereum because Uniswap is a decentralized exchange. There's problems. I know um, I'll be the first one to tell you that there's problems. There's um, uh, minor extractable value. There's sandwich attacks. Like there's there's things that go on there that aren't ideal. But I do like the fact that nobody can stop me from getting from, say, Ethereum to USDC or um, even even wrapped Bitcoin. Right. <laughs> there's there's like there's like 30 times more wrapped Bitcoin on Ethereum than there is in Lightning Network. Um, so occasionally I'll use wrapped Bitcoin to get exposure to Bitcoin. Um, and yes, I know we're talking centralized parties. That's a that's a sacrifice I've been willing to make. Um, holding stable coins kind of saved my ass in the bear market. Um, so it's like, you know, yes, I, I have plenty of Monero and that's always like a big stash. And I try never to trade out of that because like there's no trustless way except for atomic swaps. And I, I still haven't played with those yet. Um, so I feel kind of sheepish about not playing enough with atomic swaps, but <laughs> still um, early. it's still early. You got, yeah. you got time. There's no, no liquidity there, really. Yeah. Um, let's see. So as long as we're talking about stories, um, let's cover the news, the financial news, uh, obviously not the, the broader news. Um, so we have the ETFs. We're all delayed until 2024 per the SEC. I think it's like there's 260 days that they have um, to like officially respond before they have to like say no. Um, so all of that got delayed till 2024. So pretty much all of the hype about the ETFs and, oh, BlackRock this, and, you know, they're the insiders, so they'll get approved soon. That's all fizzled out. And I think that was another big part of this. Um, we pretty much, and I, I, I mean, you saw it in real time if you live on Twitter, which unfortunately I've lived a, a bit too much on Twitter, admittedly. But um, we saw kind of the, the hype and the momentum, the social psychology 
that all fizzled out. It has, it's been fizzling out for like the past two or three weeks. Um, I think people do intuit that there should have been follow through. Uh, I think people kind of know that. And another thing to think about is that like the lines are kind of drawn, like out, out there in the broad world of purchasers and non-purchasers. Yes. You've got the DCA, the stackers, the cryptonauts, the crypto bros, um, but like the people that everyone has had the opportunity to get exposure to cryptocurrency by now. And if you haven't, it's because you don't want to. So in a lot of ways, the lines are kind of drawn. And I think that's a factor in the stability of prices um, that, that crypto seems to be exhibiting over time. Um, but, um, you know, we, we really might have to wait until 2024. Um, let's see. We talked about the Binance liquidation. Um, we could. So the OFAC decision is kind of like this big thing that happened, um, which isn't necessarily that related to price. So I'll save that. Um, maybe we can talk about that later on in the show or something, but uh, I made kind of a big post breaking down what happened there. Um, I just wanted to mention that but, uh, before moving on. Um, okay. So in general, like what does the big broad, the macro news picture look like in terms of crypto? Um, we've got BlackRock that wants to get into the game. They want to offer an ETF. Um, they are insiders, so it's probably likely that that will get approved. Um, there's the grayscale lawsuit against the SEC saying, hey, you guys are not treating us fairly. You're acting uh, in an arbitrary and capricious manner in terms of the way you apply these regulations. But this is all in the courts. That's going to take time. Um, and the SEC isn't going to rule on the BlackRock ETF until 2024. So... What we have in front of us here are the Gox coin potentially being released on October 31st, although we haven't heard anything from the um, the trustee. So it, it, they could still they could still extend this. It could still happen, but um, it, it's drawing closer. Maybe it'll happen soon. Maybe it'll take until early next year. We have Binance on the ropes, and make no mistake, Binance is a big part integrated with Tether, and Binance is a big part of supporting and propping up crypto prices. Um, a lot of the move was generated by Binance and generated by the crypto insiders this past year. A lot of this move was generated by them to try and like get the FOMO, to get the hype, to get the plebs into the market. Um, but there's only so far that can go under sort of these austere um, tightening conditions that have been happening in the broader macro sense. Um, so that's like, that's kind of like the news, the, the sort of, um, uh, how would you put it, like the social, the news way of, of looking at things. Um, so with that, uh, hopefully we have time to sort of get into the charts here um, so we can like talk about the macro stuff. Um, so we'll talk about the dollar index because this is um, kind of like our big broad, you know, broad brushstrokes picture about what's what we can think about what's happening. When the dollar goes up, um, risk assets tend to go down. So um, we talked about this kind of fake out that happened, like totally faked me out too. Um, and then it bounced right back. So somewhere right around here, uh, you say, okay, you realize that was a fake out and then the direction is up. Um, this whole movement upwards is like, that was just not a good signal as we talked about the past few weeks, the fact that it continued going up. Um, it's at resistance right now. We've got sort of these multiple lines that I've drawn here. And you guys know that I draw multiple lines because um, I don't want to get married to like one particular way of drawing the line. I, I want to really understand when you're in a zone of resistance versus like actual like hard resistance. So this is like this line right here is the line. Like that's like the primary line that we should be looking at. And that's been broken. Like that's been clearly broken. Um, but I also redrew it a few different ways just because again, you know, it, it's possible that, that, uh, the chart can change just a little bit. People look at different things. So right now we're, we're kind of in this zone of resistance right here. You could almost call this candle a shooting star. Um, it's not, it's probably not quite a shooting star, but it, it wouldn't be surprising for this to take a pause momentarily. Um, I don't think, like if, if the dollar index wanted to be strong, it would have probably already just broken above here and stayed above here. And the next thing we would expect is a retrace to this and then bounce. So right now it looks like what we might see is something kind of like this, maybe down, come back here and then break to the upside. That doesn't necessarily have to happen again. When I draw these squiggles, they are not, you know, unless I'm like really hammering that I think this is what's going to happen. Uh, they're, they're, you know, they're really speculative. Um, so anyways, the point is dollar index doesn't necessarily have to break out immediately, but we should expect that this thing is eventually going to move to the upside, um, whether that's now or whether that's chop and then a little bit later. Um, but I do expect that this thing is going to move to the upside at least. At least that's what the chart says. Um, the other thing that would kind of indicate this, that would corroborate this, is the overnight repurchase agreements. Um, again, money stored with the Fed overnight. Um, you get the federal funds rate minus 0.1%. And uh, as we talked about last week, this is looking quite a lot like a bottoming pattern right here. Like this looks like it could it could move back to the upside. Um, maybe, you know, hypothetically, so see this yellow line down here? Uh, hypothetically, 
this could act as some kind of uh, resistance. So if and when price makes it there. Now, at the same time, like notice how things just crashed through there. This yellow line was not respected as a support. And when that happens, you usually don't expect it to be respected as resistance. So um, this thing does look a lot like a bottoming pattern, which would mean people moving to safety, right? People moving to the safe yield that they're going to get overnight with the Federal Reserve while maintaining high liquidity. Um, so that's what the uh, the overnight repurchase agreements would suggest there. Um, let's see. Take a look at the 10-year yield. So as we talked about last week, the 10-year yield was ready to shoot up, but that it was probably going to get some kind of resistance at this uh, at this previous peak back in October last year. So that's kind of what happened. You saw this bit of a shooting star right here, uh, and then we had sort of the first red candle in uh, in over a week. So this this will probably have some kind of resistance. There's probably some pause, which again uh, we're talking about. Uh, cross check. Whenever you're doing charts, you always want to do cross check because things are correlated, anti correlated, kind of sort of anti correlated, kind of sort of correlated, right? So you want to like paint a big picture if you can and get a bunch of different charts to see if they're if they're painting a similar story, which right now they are. Yeah. Dollar index is at a little bit of resistance, but wants to go higher. The 10 year yield looks like it wants to go higher, but again, is that resistance? And then we've got the repurchase agreements, which are sort of inversely correlated to the dollar index in, in kind of a certain way, or at least to risk assets, is forming a base and is ready to move to the upside. So um, this, this, will come, this will be important later when we start talking about crypto uh, and what prices are doing there. We talked about gold already, um, so kind of uh, expecting this to come back to the downside. Um, at some point here, gold is going to act like a protection asset because there is still a lot of inflation out there. Um, it, it is it is manipulated. It is the prices are managed and controlled, but it's not 100. percent You know, everything it's not everything is manipulation. It's just that we know that the cabal, the people, the deep state, whoever they don't want to see gold um, become like a safe haven asset, so they screw with it as much as they can. So we need to expect that will probably happen. Um, let's take a look here at at Bitcoin and Ethereum. Because uh, we've been looking at this chart for a long time. This is uh, sort of the sum of Bitcoin and Ethereum market caps. You know, this breakdown was was like a very clear breakdown. Um, one thing that's happened here with this chart that's not good at all is that we're already below those August, that the, the August highs from last year. Uh, and things just broke down through that. You would have wanted to see this area at least hold a support and then kind of bounce back to the top side. Um, with the way these chart structures work, like that's that's really, you want to see this hold support retest that maybe and then come back down and this retest is like your opportunity to get out if you didn't get out um right now <laughs> there hasn't you know it's just been down uh in terms of the bitcoin and ethereum when we look at them together so this is not a good chart this is this does not look like a chart <laughs> that's about to go make new uh, local <laughs> highs so uh let's see here moving on um, oh yeah, we need to look at the uh, the yield curve inversion. Yield curve inversion is the pink line on the bottom. This thing is more inverted than it basically ever has been. It's like historically more inverted than ever. Um, it's the sum of all of these different. So you'll notice the one year, the two year, the five year, the ten year, the thirty year. Um, you can look at any one of these in isolation. You could say what's the spread between the one year and the thirty year, or the five year and the ten year. And people look at that when they say the yield curve is inverted. They're usually talking about just a pair of um you know of different uh, maturity linked bonds but what i do is i sort of take the difference between all of them and then i sum them up or i average them uh and that's what produces this pink line so i can get like an overall picture of what the overall yield uh, yield curve inversion looks like so anything below zero uh this uh obviously this this line right here anything below zero is inverted um and again the thing that indicates a stock market like major systemic crash is nearing or, or could be close is when you see this yield curve inversion violently uh, correct back into positive where it's no longer inverted. Um, but usually you only have like a day, like one or two days, a week if you're lucky. But you usually might only have like one day to actually like see this thing do this before like the market really tanks. So if mm -hmm. this thing jumps to the upside, like, and you got stocks or whatever, like just, I mean, just smash the sell button. Um, you, we won't like, there won't be enough time for me to hear on a Saturday morning to tell you like, Oh, this, ha it'll be too late. So, you know, if you see that thing, just smash to the upside. Um, that's, you got to get out like this. It's, or, it's been inverted for, for so long though. Right. It has. Yeah. So there's no reason that it necessarily has to come back to, um, to being not inverted. And in fact, I think that the feds reverse repo facility could, um, could keep the yield curve inverted for like 
it, it could go on for years for all we know. Um, it has gone on for years. So if you look um, back here at 2000, that would be 2006 to 2008 or 2007. Uh, when in 2006, though? Uh, beginning of 2006 to the middle of two. So about a year and a half before this yield curve um, corrected. To and that was right before the 2008 financial crisis. Right? Exactly. Right. So, um, you know, but with the with the Fed's reverse repo facility, which, you know, they've never operated like they are now. It's possible that that could drive this yield curve inversion to just stay inverted for a long time. But um, even so, it's like it's something it's a very important signal to keep track of. It's an imminent crash signal. Um, so, again, like if this thing pops to the upside, like on, on a Monday afternoon, like either you need to smash the sell button on fucking everything or you need to take some kind of like crazy out of the money um, options short on uh, anything. Doesn't matter. Probably just like the the Nasdaq would be fine there. Um, so, anyways, that's the uh, that's the yield curve inversion. Um, not too much here to look at. We could just take a quick look at the balance sheet. Um, basically, as of the past week, the Federal Reserve balance sheet has contracted by looks like about um, what would that be fifty million, fifty billion dollars, another fifty billion. Um, so yeah, that thing's contracting. Um, the M2 money supply, this is delayed. You'll notice that's only from July. So we, we don't have any of the recent data from the past two months, but it's always delayed. That's always the case. Um, <clears throat> we don't need anything else there. want to quickly cover the International Monetary Fund and um, what central banks are using as reserves. So um, central banks hold each other's currencies as reserves in addition to gold and probably other stuff. Um, back in March when the whole banking crisis was happening and then the Fed was just like on it like flies on shit, um, I was telling everyone, I said, hey, you know, the dollar is not going away as the world's reserve currency asset. Look at this data right here. The data we were looking at at the time was Q2, sorry, Q4 for 2022. And a lot of people said, well, you know, that's that's last year. The, the crisis just happened. Everyone's going to dump the dollar now. And I said, OK, but probably not. We finally have data for Q1 2023, which was when the banking crisis took place. And um, basically, the U.S. dollar gained ever so slightly. So um, the U.S. dollar is currently being used at about 59%. Um, it depends um, on whether you want to include the unallocated reserves, but it's something like 55 to 59% of the fiat currency held by central banks across the world is US dollars. And that's been consistent for quite a long time. So um, yeah, I mean, the dollar is, is not going anywhere. There's just nothing to replace it. But I just wanted to quickly cover that. Um, the data that we have doesn't show us that central banks are dumping dollars as reserve assets. There's just nothing to replace it. None of the nations want to export their currency that causes a hollowing out of your manufacturing base. Um, and they just don't want to do it. So there's just nothing like there's nothing to replace the ugly dollar. Like it's, it's, it's the least ugly, uh, you know, currency out there in terms of fiat. So, um, let's see, we could talk about the stock market just very quickly. Um, we don't need to talk much about it. This is the NASDAQ. So, you know, things broke above this and then we had this really nice, big, long, you know, pump almost quite nearly um, got back to the all time highs. Things have come back down here and have hit this line again. So painting the picture of the dollar index need is at resistance. It needs a moment to pause. The 10 year yield needs a moment to pause. Um, it looks like we could see potentially some kind of rebound, uh, some kind of support happen here. Maybe it could play out like that, right? So hypothetically, you know, you could find some port, some port, come up down here, test this again. And if you come up here and then test this line again and you start to see that, that is, again, a sign that that more downside is on the way for the stock market. Uh, that's the S&P. Uh, sorry, that was the NASDAQ. And then the S&P, kind of, kind of same story here. Um, let's go ahead and turn on the wave magic and just take a quick look at, at that. Um, it takes a second to compute. Uh, if it doesn't want to, then we'll just move on. Sometimes it's slow. Sometimes it's it's fast. What is what are you loading now? This is oh okay. You're the wave. Yeah, the so I call it wave magic, but it's really you could think of it like advanced Bollinger bands. But I mean, come on, what sounds cooler, wave magic or advanced <laughs> Bollinger bands? So again, the the blue lines are upper standard deviation across multiple different timelines. Um, again, so it's like if you look at, a, at one moving average, you'd be like, I love looking at the twenty one day moving average because that's three weeks, and that's I don't know that aligns with astrology. Uh, but someone else is like, yeah, but I like a hundred day moving average because it's a round number. The, forget that. Forget all that noise. Like just overlay all of the moving averages at the same time from like from, from the 10 day to the hundred day to the thousand day to the 5,000 day, which is the maximum 5,000 periods is the maximum. You can look back, um, just overlay them all together. And this is what pops out when you do that. Um, 
something I've been using for a long time, but I've, I kind of kept pretty close to the vest. I haven't really wanted to share it because it's, um, it's a unique idea and I've never seen it anywhere else. So anyways, we've got these like clusters of bands right now. We're, um, essentially the S and P, um, after bottoming here last year, um, got back up into the main standard deviation cluster. And then once we got to this point right here, uh, and this point right here, I said, okay, we're getting close. Like we're not, I'm not top calling yet, but we're getting close. You rarely see a chart that will go to a large cluster. So going back a little bit further, um, you can see that price basically rode the standard deviation lines all the way until the peak of 2021. And when price comes back down and then falls out of like the upper standard deviation cluster like that, when it finally rebounds to the upside, you almost never see it come here establish support immediately and then go to the tops, you know, start going for a new bull run in right. almost all cases. These are, I think these are psychological levels because humans are very good statistical intuition machines, especially in aggregate. So when you get to this, uh, to this, this area right here, you think, okay, we're getting close. Things popped up to the top side and now things are going to have to come and take a look down at the bottom uh, or sorry, take a look at, it's going to have to find support somewhere, right? Could that be, could that be like regular pleb lines? Could it be somewhere like this? You know, I think it's very likely again that the S and P is, is going to find support at this sort of convergence of that previous uh, peak that we saw in August last year, and also sort of the bottom range of that standard deviation cluster. I think that's likely maybe to range here for a little bit, um, and then we'll have to play it by ear. But I don't think that the S and P is just going to, or the Nasdaq are just going to rebound from here. Um, okay. So that's enough on the S and P I'm trying to fly through some of this stuff cause I'm, I'm trying to cover it all <laughs> since there's so much price action, uh, that, that happened. Um, let's just look at Bitcoin in isolation. This was the chart that I posted on Twitter. Um, I try not to bombard with charts. There was a whole more, a bunch of stuff I could have posted on Twitter, but I really want people just to see the big picture here. And the big picture is that, um, you know, we, we have this big rising wedge, um, that in these rising wedges tend to break down unless you're in like a very macro bullish scenario, which we were not. So um, really like your moment to get out of this chart was this dotted line right here was when price came down, it broke the main line, uh, which was, uh, sorry, it broke the main line, which was this guy right here. Um, at least that's the way, that's kind of what I considered to be um, the main line. Or I'm sorry, excuse me. Let's actually just remove that. This main line, because this is the easiest one. It makes the most sense. It connects the most points easily, right? Whatever. Um, so we broke that down and then we're sitting at this dotted line right here. And that dotted line was very important because that was the bottom of the summer low of 2021. That was kind of like the close price support. So not the wick support, but the close price support of 2022 when things just before things crashed back down um, to below 20K. And then that line also acted as support here. That was like our first major, uh, sorry, resistance area. Um, and then the hope was, you know, that we had gotten above that, finally establish it as support. Um, and then we could make another run to the upside. But that's not what happened. Um, <clears throat> instead, you know, when price got down here, uh, and then I posted on Twitter, like, guys, take profit, like, get out now. Because, I mean, again, if you've been in the market since down down here, which you, you should have been, um, and that's what that's what we recommended here, um, you know, this is like the time to say, okay, this is your long-term trading stack, but things need to go down. Like, just take that off the table for now, and we'll see when, when is a good reentry on that long-term trading stack. Um, but the breakdown of, of this line, like even getting down to there shouldn't have happened. And that's when I dumped uh, my long-term positions um, because like with all of the news, all the negative news with Binance and, and the ETFs being delayed and, the, and the, the hype fizzling out and just everything across the board was just negative, negative. I said, no, like, I'm not going to wait for us to break this down and then break that down. I'm just going to get out now. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But, um, you know, that's that uh, it just it doesn't look good. And it's just like the intuition. Everything is lining up like, no, let's just get out. Um, so, yeah, we've got this this big breakdown that happened here. We should be coming up on kind of like an interim support um, on this next dotted line. You'll see that was like the, the top of the market in August uh, for Bitcoin. Um, that the sorry last August obviously, uh, which was also another kind of uh, resistance area as well. Um, going backwards, uh, no, that's only relevant for that time period. Um, so I would expect this should act as some kind of support. Maybe we'll get some rebound up here. Um, you could probably swing trade that if you want, and maybe I will. If um, you know things are kind of looking kind of congruent where we should see some support soon. Um, this is still falling knife territory, so you, you got to be really careful with that. Um, you know, I just, you know, I don't want anyone to, 
to uh to be like oh body said uh, time for swing trade that's not what i'm saying just it's 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 a possibility you, it's on the table what do you what do you think the the scenario where we we go back down to like 2022 levels you think that's that's oh yeah actually in the cards oh yeah 100 percent um I definitely think that's that's a very easy possibility. So we could draw easily kind of a line that um, goes right here. So kind of like this area in general, right? That's sort of the, that wasn't like the ultimate washout lows, but that was kind of like the support that happened for quite a long time last year. It would be entirely unsurprising to see price drop down to this area. Maybe it could find support um, right there. Because uh, I do think that there's going to be strong buying at some point. Strong buying is going to come in. People are going to say, oh, you know, this looks like the Bitcoin bottom. Oh, this looks like that kind of like double tap uh, that, that, that we've seen happen before, whether that was the bear market last time or the bear market in 2015, 2016. Um, I do think you'll see people and institutions um, get back in here and, and feel comfortable um, with, with starting to scale back in. So, uh, But I, I do think that very likely at some point um, this area is on the table. Another thing we can look at here is let's go to the BLX chart, which is sort of the lifetime chart. And this is kind of something I just did this morning just to play around. So um, hopefully these are familiar lines for you guys now. The uh, This is the regression analysis. Um, those are the, These are the extension lines right here. So the actual regression analysis lines I don't have turned on, but um, these, are, these are good for... Uh, <laughs> Sorry, that's kind of a weird way to phrase that. Just know that these dotted lines here, the color, the blue, the yellow, and the, the the red are the regression analysis, the red being like the lower boundary of Bitcoin price, and the blue being the upper. So what did I do? What is this uh, What is this fractal here? What is this dubious fractal that I've, I've overlaid the, the blue line here? That is Bitcoin from, if you were to take, uh, if you were to start from about right here, to the top of the market. So that would be the 2014, uh, sorry, the 2015 bear market all the way to the top of the 2017 bull market. Um, that's putting it over here. You'll notice it's not quite the same. So what did I do? I scaled it down to match the uh, the boundaries of Bitcoin price. Uh, yeah. And then I you know, kind of lined it up with where it seems like it would make sense. So this right here, obviously being the first touch of the low, the all-time low, which lined up with like November of 2015, 2014. It's lined up in November 2014, uh, which is you know pretty close right here to actually touching the the lows of 2022, which um, you know uh, November 2022. So that's kind of like the place you would line that up. These are closed prices, right? So the 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 fractal is not the wicks; it's only the closed prices on the weekly. Um, let's go to the weekly. Actually, this makes probably easier, more sense from the weekly. Okay. So if we were to like draw this fractal out here and say, okay, could price kind of look like it did, um, you know, in this uh, sort of bear market and recovery, I think that's a reasonable um, possibility because I think the mechanisms that drove this bull market were very similar to the mechanisms that drove the 2014. So maybe the bear will be similar. Anyways, this is what it would look like. So it would not surprise me at all for price to come back down to the regression analysis, which is currently at about 20K. 19 and a half thousand and then to just kind of like bounce along this for some period of time so what i'm saying is that i do think it could be until middle of 2024 that we actually set any new local high um we might need to bounce down here for quite some time um that's well, we're, just... we're thinking of doing monero topia in let's see uh like probably 2024 november through like 2025 january how, how are we doing around that all right yeah you, it that's something start to pick up <laughs> i mean you know as dubious <laughs> as fractals are if, <laughs> if we were to yeah so this would actually be the time that uh, that you might see some fresh uh local highs. all right yeah well, we'll do it right there what's that top you did right there what's that date right there? that'd be forty three thousand. Now that would be nice oh what's the, the end... date what's the date on that oh uh that's uh this this right here is uh december of 2024 all right so Okay. Let's see. Let's erase that. So right here, this top is uh, October 2024, and then this top is December 2024. Okay. Good time. Oh, man, man, we got covering a lot, moving, moving fast. Sorry, I don't want to like hog the whole show today. Um, they just cut me off at any time. It was like, okay, we, uh, okay that's we enough. Like a body it's too show, just a dedicated show, just for bodies. You can. <laughs> no, we want all. them here. We want them here. <laughs> I thought about it. I, I thought about it. I know that putting on these shows are a lot of work. I see all the work that you guys do, and I'm just like, man, that's podcast yeah, is a lot we, of work. We want, to, we want to keep you here, but do what you got to do. Okay, so Bitcoin dominance uh, has interestingly fallen. Um, Bitcoin dominance is not 
performing here as, as the bear market kind of uh, takes another swipe at people. Interesting. Interesting to look at. Uh, Ethereum versus Bitcoin. Um, remember, we talked about this descending wedge. This descending wedge is almost certainly going to break to the upside at some point. It doesn't have to be now. Um, probably it'll stay in this range. But at some point here, this thing's going to break to the upside, much to the chagrin of maximalists. But for all of the reasons that I like, I didn't want to be like an Ethereum, you know, a meth head or anything. It's just that I found myself there writing out the bear market. And I was like, oh, I can use this, uh, this Uniswap stuff and their decks and all this stuff to get in, get exposure to, to Bitcoin or just buy Ethereum or buy some degenerate, you know, shit coins could be Link, could be other ones, which shall not be named, which have collapsed very, very, very badly. Um, hopefully people didn't get taken there. Uh, anyways, um, Ethereum, just like, it's just a useful platform and whether or not it's like, if it's centralized and it's bad and it's the, it's the Illuminati coin, uh, you know, whatever, like it's useful. And I found myself using it and I can't be the only one, right? Like sometimes I'll use things that like I'm going through as kind of a proxy to say, yeah, it's, it's likely that other people are experiencing the same thing. I think that's what's happening with Ethereum. We've talked about this for a long time. It's important. And at some point it's going to really perform. Um, doesn't have to be now, but it's going to break to the upside eventually sometime here between now, now and like next year. Um, okay. Finally, finally. Ah, XMR Bitcoin. <laughs> or sorry, X, just XMR. Who right. cares about Bitcoin? But let's take a look right. at the ratio. Because... <laughs> we like XMR Bitcoin. <laughs> it's, you know, right now, like XMR Bitcoin has, with Bitcoin falling, XMR has jumped to the top side. Um, again, this would kind of be another little, like, tiny, hmm, uh, that is CZ selling Bitcoin to try and prop up the price of BNB. Like, is someone out there selling specifically Bitcoin and not Ethereum and not Monero and not um, some of these other altcoins because again, Bitcoin dominance dropped. So, uh, you know, that's that doesn't prove anything. It's just like another tiny little point. Anyways, uh, Monero Bitcoin has has um, bumped to the top side of kind I of. I think main, it's always uh, a great indication, though, right? When when Bitcoin drops, Monero it does like a little little leg up against Bitcoin. That's yeah. That's see, that is like that was such a market thing of the bear market in general. Um, was was that Monero performed for the entire bear market versus yeah. Bitcoin. Beautiful. And I, I think that's very telling, you know, like that is fundamentals asserting themselves during a bear market. Exactly. Um, so I think that the sort of, if my thesis is right, and from now until the end of the, the year, we're kind of looking at negative price pressures across the board, whether that's stocks, crypto, again, with little bounces here and there along the way. Um, this would be a good thing. Like the the sort of silver lining here is that XMR BTC ratio should start performing again. And you'll notice that um, this is our, our sort of resistance line right here. You'll notice we're, we're bumping up uh, against that. We bumped there, we bumped there. We didn't even come all the way back down to the bottom of this line before stopping. And then again, sort of coming near to the top of that area. So yeah, what we really want to see is follow through over the next week, over the next two weeks. Um, to where we make it basically to this next sort of interim line. Uh, that's sort of like the next major uh, resistance that you would look at this chart. Um, so uh, this thing has been chopping sideways for quite a while. Like we've talked is, you know, that's just what you should expect. Um, but there, there, it does look like the possibility is, is developing for this thing to start bumping to the upside and uh, to making its way back to the, uh, uh, let's at least take, uh, take back the 006 level. That would be nice. Uh, yeah. 007 is, I think, ever, like one of the more prominent but the 006 is kind of like 007 is prominent socially because it's cool to say, <laughs> but 006 is kind of like the, um, uh, the, from the last bear market from the 2019, uh, bear market where we, where we bottomed. So when was the last time we were at 0.01? 0.01. That would have been actually very recently, like, okay. 0. 0.0095. That would have been, um, January of this year. Okay. So go yeah. figure January of this year, right. When all the markets start pumping. And just like I told you guys, the a lot of insiders, a lot of the crypto suits and the inside cabal pumped Bitcoin and pumped crypto, but specifically Bitcoin, because if you have limited funds, you're going to throw them at the, the most important one in people's minds to try and generate the FOMO. And that's like the pattern that they do. You can expect that to happen whenever we enter to the next like real bull market, which this was not a real bull market. This was just like, a, you know, this was just an interim uh, sort of uh, bounce, you know, and it is like it, it's it's the forming of the bottom, probably. Um Let's see, Monero versus US dollar. Okay, so we crashed, you know, just like everybody else did um, below this kind of like big long term line, which, you know, you don't want to see that break down, but um, it looks like it looks like that line is probably going to pose resistance. This line has just gone from being support. So uh, this line right here. Oh, hang on. If I can get it, my charts are slow. Uh, that line right there. So 
Um, that's basically going to be a resistance line from now on. Um, but you can see that what happened is we came from the top of the standard deviation range here. And then when things fell, it finds support near the bottom of that area. If things get really bad, and I think it's very possible Monero might create nice divergence and just kind of hold its price while the rest of crypto over the rest of the year um, is having problems. I think crypto uh, Monero, there's a good case to be made that it could... Um, uh, have kind of another bull market again uh, in terms relative to Bitcoin and in terms to the rest of crypto. So I do think that this um, these lower standard deviations are a good support area. Um, we do know that volatility happens. If volatility does happen, I think that this cluster of uh, moving averages right here, which is kind of like the long-term cluster of moving averages, that will be a really good support. That has been our bear market support for Monero uh, repeatedly. So Worst case scenario is probably about $120, $120 uh, Monero, um, with kind of this being the more like overall support. So about $130. Um, so that's kind of what to how to think about this chart right here. Um, again, to support the case that Monero could uh, <laughs> multiple things. Again, cross check. If you're going to be like some kind of chart astrologer and reading the tea leaves or whatever, um, you need to do cross check. You can't just look at one chart and say, this chart looks good and it's gonna go that way. You've gotta paint the picture. You've gotta see, does everything line up together? Um, and again, we are seeing that. We're seeing this big head and shoulders here on the Monero dominance. Um, so if Monero dominance is gonna go to the upside, which is what this chart uh, indicates, and we've also got the Monero Bitcoin chart that looks like it's forming a temporary bottom um, right here. And we know that Monero does well in the bear markets relative to the other coins. What does that tell us? Well, it says that it looks like Monero is setting up to do well relative to the other coins, which would ind indicate um, that we're kind of got a reassertion of the bear market here um, coming at us. So, pretty much a um, guarantee. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's um, I, I promise Body you. Guarantee. I know exactly what's going to happen. Yeah. The funny thing is when I'm like really careful and I'm like, well, it looks like probably this is going to happen. I feel pretty confident about this, but I'm not like, it's going to happen, guys. Yeah. Um, like right. then the thing will happen. But like the moment that I start getting a little bit too confident. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is the don't, moment don't, it jinx it. don't jinx it. Yeah. <laughs> don't, All right. don't jinx our bear market. <laughs> yeah. All right, man. Uh, you covered a lot. It was a big week. So yeah, every, everybody, everything's going, going to hell in a handbasket except for Monero, folks. I think that's... <laughs> <laughs> yep. That, that would Monero be nice. is your safe play. That would sell nice. everything else. Um, all right, man. Thank you so much. As <laughs> always, right, body bringing it. And hopefully you'll stick around because I think we even mentioned you in some of the some of the news this week. You did a great a great tweet thread on the, the OFAC. on the OFAC findings. Yes. Awesome. Yeah, I'd love, um, to, uh, I'd love to chat about that. All right, sweet. Yeah, please stick around. All right, guys. See you. All Cheers. right. Thanks, you, buddy.